I'm saying. All right, there. That's that's better. That's perfect. Yeah. All right. So All more right, announcements. So upcoming, uh, actually, uh, um, we don't have a couple of them on there that we are we're doing. Actually, next week I'll be doing uh, the talk on kratom. It's an update. I didn't put that in yet. So that will be next week's talk. And coming up, we got some great stuff on prevention in rural America. And we're bringing in our friend Ryan Kelly to talk a little bit about harm reduction. And uh, so, yeah, lots of lots of interesting things coming up. But next week, uh, Kratom update. A lot of interesting new stuff. Yes. And then if we don't get some on the week after, we're still working on scheduling. I will have one on alcohol and exercise, like how alcohol does impact fitness and exercise and recovery. So. Free CME still as always, please turn your videos on if you can. Again, this is the man who invented this whole program. So probably should show off our people. Um, you can chat in and you will all get the emails, of course, with the um, survey or at the end of the Echo Today, you'll see it in the chat. The yeah, just survey make, monkey. Yeah, but just make sure that if you need anything, please just reach out. I know we do get a lot of phone calls from all over about uh, questions about uh, patients with addiction. So uh, you can reach out to Aaron who you also see on the on the uh, Echo today, or Heather, myself, and there's our cell phones. Give us a ring if you have a question. I'm going to let you go because I'm going to do a couple slides from now. Okay, so, and again, if you want to look at the uh, Center for Opioid Resources and Education, you can go on there. All of the different things and the manual will be on there short shortly, we hope, still in process. And again, on the Addiction Connection podcast, uh, just we just released yesterday uh, Prazosin as a off-label use for alcohol use disorder. Uh, it's kind of interesting stuff. It's you know we use it up for other things like PTSD and all. Uh, but uh, there's some pretty good studies. And it's kind of an interesting thing. So uh, feel free to check that out. Oops, I covered it up. Um because I didn't have a chance to edit. I will just speak really quickly. Murray McAllister, y'all, he has presented to us three different times. Again, sorry about the pictures. Um, uh, he passed away unexpectedly at the end of December, and it's still very, very, very sad. And if, for those of you who don't know him or don't recall, he was like imperative and pivotal in Minnesota for the change, the way that people think about pain and um, just a very amazing man that literally we're going to be missing for a long, long, long time. Um, there's a couple of quotes that I pulled out of his previous talks. What accounts for health behavior change is not the specific interventions you deliver, but the qualities of the therapeutic relationship. So this is huge for all of us to always remember when we're interacting um, with patients, one of Murray's big things, and then put everything about work drama and your personal life aside when you walk through the exam room door and be present and attentive to your patient. And that is how we are going to elicit any type of change or help or support for any of our patients, regardless of what the diagnosis is, you need to have that therapeutic relationship first. So for those of you who knew Murray, this was a huge shock to all of us. Um, I will stop before I start crying again. Yeah, and I think, you know, the way I'll always remember, every time he gave a talk, frankly, he just totally blew my mind. Uh, some of the stuff that he talked about was so, uh, so interesting. So uh, sadly, we'll be missed. So yes, And Charlie put that in there, too. Super professional, very, oh my gosh, even mannered. He's the most calm human, like the opposite of Kurt um, in terms of calm, <laughs> but very thoughtful, just really changed the way all of us think about a lot of things. Um, so anyway. So with that, um, Sanjeev, are you going to share, do you want to share your own slides then? I could take I our I think summer. that would be better if you would allow Perfect. me. Oh, better. for sure. It'd be easier for me too, clearly. So Dr. Aurora, as we mentioned, um, the, the brainchild behind Project Echo many, many years ago, we had the honor of going down to obviously immersion training. So we were able to do this program, um, hepatologist down in New Mexico, which is kind of how this all got started. And um, he has presented hepatitis C stuff to us a couple of times, but as it's ever changing, um, we asked him to come back, especially for the fifth anniversary of our Echo. So take it away. And any Thank questions, y'all, please just chat them in and we can help facilitate that at the end too. Thank you. So what we will we'll do right now is uh, speak for about 25 minutes and then uh, leave about 10, 15 minutes for questions so we can uh, uh, hear from you and what problems you're having. And, and so I, I just want to um, get started so that I also want to thank Heather and, and um, 
Kurt for partnering with us. They are truly game changers. As some of you who have interacted with them, amazing people who get up every morning to serve their communities. And I've always find them as, uh, find, find them as such a um, such an inspiring uh, sort of leaders and um, totally committed to the area of substance use. And thank you, Katie, for also your support. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about hepatitis C here. I'm a professor at the University of New Mexico. And I will talk a little bit fast, but if you stop me, I will stop right away and answer it. So you just, the best way to stop me because I can't see all of you is to just re, um, uh, really unmute and say, and ask your question. So about 70 million people infected with hepatitis C worldwide. In the United States, we have about 2.7 million people infected with the virus. And this is the data from the US government. This is a paper Thank from you. We're only still seeing your, um, at least I'm only seeing the PowerPoint like creator. Presenter view. Yeah. We're not, there we go. Okay. Now? Nothing. But now you're not seeing anything. No. Correct. And now I want you to, okay. Okay, let's see. How about now? Is it okay or no? You yes. don't see Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So the important part of this slide is straightforward, that what the US government is saying that if you don't treat these 2.7 million people, about 1.47 million will develop cirrhosis, 350,000 will develop, 350,000 and about 900,000 will develop, um, will die. Now the question is, what if you treated 75% of them? So, so, the, so the, the issue, of course, is a lot of these lives can be saved if you were to treat them. That's the key. So uh, because you are actually going to be able to um, prevent these deaths, and I'll show you what percentage of them you can present uh, prevent if you treat them all. Now, the, the diagnosis is pretty straightforward. You do a hepatitis C antibody test. If it's positive, you do an HCV RNA. If it's negative, you stop. So it's simple. It's not complicated. Uh, you do the antibody positive HCV RNA test. Now, there'll be a few people that will have a positive antibody and their RNA will be negative. So the question will be, what do they have? If, if your LFTs are normal, don't do anything. If the LFTs are abnormal, you want to evaluate for other etiologies of liver disease. So now, what happens if you treat 15% of people, you can see you save a small number of lives, you save about 25,000 lives. If you save, but basically what we are saying is if you treat 75% of the people, you will save almost 200 plus thousand lives here. So this is again, the US government slide, I haven't made it, um, saying how many, how many lives you can save by just treating. How do you save them? Even if a person has a cirrhosis, which is often how people die, this is a paper in JAMA, there'll be a 70% reduction in risk of death if you cure these patients, right? That's just, the bottom line is if you get a sustained viral response or cure, and the top is if you don't. Now, what is the risk reduction in cancer? If somebody has cirrhosis and you cure them, there'll be about an 80% reduction in risk of getting liver cancer. It's not going to go to zero, but you'll get tremendous number of lives saved. What is the likelihood that they'll get liver failure in the past? Liver failure meaning ascites and jaundice and encephalopathy and bleeding. There'll be 90% reduction. But once you treat them, even if they have cirrhosis, they're not going to get liver failure. 
nine out of 10 are not going to get it. So the impact is huge. So the other issue is echo, I mean, the hepatitis C treatment doesn't just reduce mortality from liver disease, it reduces all cause mortality. And hazard ratio is 0 0.5 if you cure the people, half the risk. And the reason for that is hepatitis C causes a lot more than liver disease. I'll show you a couple of examples of that. So we know that if you have a person has hepatitis C, they get more heart attacks. Okay. So if you treat them and cure them, 16.3 heart attacks per thousand patient years. If you don't treat them, 30 heart attacks. So big, almost twice as many cardiovascular events. Similarly, they have more diabetes, they have more many things. So now when you, when you diagnose a patient with hepatitis C, what should you do? You wanna to explain to them what's the natural history of the disease. What is the mode of transmission? how to avoid transmission to family members, and the promise of highly effective interferon-free treatments. You won't believe this, but a lot of my patients in my clinic still think that the treatment of hepatitis C is interferon-based. And it, it, this word doesn't get around that we have a completely safe medicine right now, which has no side effects. You So, what should you do? You want to vaccinate them for hepatitis A and B. You want to counsel them for weight loss. Obesity increases the likelihood of cirrhosis. You don't want them to take too much acetaminophen. You want to see if they have cirrhosis and avoid non-steroidal drugs. This is very important because these drugs are what cause GI bleeding in people with cirrhosis and often death. They'll want to know, can they have sex with their loved one without contraception? And the answer is yes. If, we are, if they're in a monogamous relationship and they are doing usual sex, they can have sex without contraception. If it's a monogamous long-term relationship. If somebody has multiple sexual partners or, or also has HIV, they must use barrier uh, uh, sort of... Uh, protection. They need to stop smoking because smoking, the odds ratio of developing cirrhosis of the liver, if you use marijuana, if you smoke, three and a half times greater. Smoking inhibits the healing process of the whole body. So losing weight, stopping smoking, and discontinuing marijuana use slows the progress of liver disease. Alcohol, of course, hepatitis C has a synergistic effect. I'm not going to go into all the things, but it's two plus two is equal to nine. And so one needs to focus on that in a big way. This is a meta-analysis of 34 studies asking the question, you all are primary care clinicians, and you, know, you treat a lot of diabetes, but you can see that somebody who has hepatitis C, their risk of having diabetes is 1.68 times greater than if they don't have hepatitis C. So hepatitis C is a systemic inflammatory disease, and that's why it causes heart attacks and diabetes and all these other things that we are talking about. So treating these people will lower their risk of getting diabetes. This is really important. And it's specific for the hepatitis C virus. So if you ask the question, does hepatitis B increase diabetes? No. Does HIV increase diabetes? No. It's hepatitis C that increases diabetes. So somebody has hepatitis C and HIV versus HIV alone, their risk of diabetes is 1.8 times than if they had no hepatitis C. And then because it is a systemic disease, it causes a lot of other bad things like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, vasculitis, kidney disease, et cetera. 
All in all, su summarizing to say, this is cryoglobulinemia, it's a bad disease and you need to treat every single patient, period. Without exception, they should get treatment. And so if they have cirrhosis, you want to screen them for liver cancer every six months. You want to avoid hepatotoxic drugs. You want to prioritize the patients with cirrhosis so they get treatment right away. You don't want these people to wait in a line and get treatment six months or a year later because you can save their life with treatment. We do want to measure their, do they have cirrhosis? There are two types of cirrhosis that, or fibrosis that are important because these people need screening for liver cancer. That is if you have F3, which is bridging fibrosis, or F4, which is cirrhosis. And of course, we suspect cirrhosis by clinical exam, spiders, palmar erythema, gynecomastia, but also through low platelet count, low albumin, high prothrombin time, high EPRI score, and you can see neutropenia, all of these. I almost never do liver biopsies on hepatitis C patients. I can get there on with, the, with just the clinical features and the I, this test is helpful. It's called an APRI score. You take that. We'll send you a copy of these slides, uh, Heather, if that's okay. So I won't go into everything in detail because I want to leave time for questions. The APRI score is you look at the AST level divided by the platelet count into 100. And then this will give. So if a patient has an AST of 80, upper limit of normal, we count always as 40. It's not what is in your lab results. You divide 80 by 40, you get two. So then what happens is platelet count is 130. So you divide two by 130, multiply by 100, you get 1.54, which suggests that the patient may have cirrhosis. The most important machine, I don't know if you have access, how many of you have access to it, but if you have access in your town to a fibro scan and you're suspecting cirrhosis, you send them for a fibro scan. And this is a very highly non-invasive test of diagnosing cirrhosis of the liver. If you don't suspect cirrhosis based on labs or clinical exam, you don't need to get a fibro scan, just treat them. The treatment is extraordinarily amazing now, and it was based on the development of multiple drugs acting on all different aspects of it, hepatitis virus replication. One is protease inhibitors, polymerase inhibitors, NS5A agent inhibitors. And the major breakthrough of cirrhosis occurred because of the formation of this drug, which is a polymerase inhibitor. This drug is called the phosphivir, which is what, it, what is called a chain terminator. So what is happening? This is the hepatitis C virus. It's replicating now. C1C was added. This is, there's a template strand there. Then the, the counterpart of U is A and got ended. This is the primer strand. This is the template strand. But what happens when you give sophosphivir, it comes and does this. This is sophosphivir in blue. It essentially blocks the chain from elongating. So it's what's called the chain terminator. This drug revolutionized the treatment of hepatitis C. And see now when a new nucleotide comes, it can't attach, okay? So that's the idea. So you cannot, so the virus cannot replicate. This is that drug. And uh, a commonly used medicine now is sophosphivir plus an NS5 agent called lidipasvir. And you can see here, these drugs are so good. They have almost no side effects. Cure rates are in the 90% range. 
they are just, they annihilate this virus, basically. You give that drug to the patient almost a couple of weeks, the viral load is completely normal. Um, and this is the medicine here called Eclusa, which is pan-genopitic drug. It acts on all genotypes. Just give one pill a day. This is 400 milligrams of phosphobir, 100 milligram valpatasbir, a different NS5A agent, and it will get a 98, 99% cure rate. 95% of patients will have no side effects, and a few will have an occasional headache. Then, so you, if whether they have cirrhosis or not, it doesn't really matter. You see, this is cirrhosis, abclusa, sophosphobia. Look, these are the cure rates, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99. It's just too good, basically. It's like this magic bullet that cures hepatitis C virus. What do you have to be careful of when we use this medicine? Is you have to be careful of drug side effects, okay? Like drug interaction. So it's not that the patient feels sick with the medicine. The patient doesn't feel anything. But the maybe I'm using the wrong word. Side effect isn't the right word. If any of these medicines, rifampin, St. John's Ward, carbamazepine, et cetera, are given, or if you give it along with a amiodarone, then you can get either failure of the drug or serious symptomatic bradycardia with amiodarone. So you have to be very careful that you're not using a drug that is interacting. There are some people who have what we call NS5A resistance, that you use those medicines, Eplusa or Maverit, and you did not get cured. And now they have NS5A resistance. There's another pill called Vosevi, cost $90,000 for a three week, for a 12 week treatment, but it will again cure the vast majority of patients. Um, but these are people who were previously treated with an NS5A inhibitor and actually now have essentially got resistance. So who should get sofosbuvir, well, patisvir, is people with cirrhosis and people who have compensated, so people without cirrhosis or people who have compensated cirrhosis. If you have decompensated cirrhosis, you cannot get this medicine because it has what we call a protease inhibitor, VOX, and protease inhibitors cannot be given to people with advanced cirrhosis. There's another medicine called Maverit in the marketplace, which has a protease inhibitor and a NS5A inhibitor. Again, the details are not important. The drug is you take three pills a day in the morning. Again, almost completely safe. No side effects, but has the same issue that we talked about earlier. Drug interactions are possible. And you can see here cure rates, all genotypes are 9,900, 9,900. Genotype four, which we rarely see in the United States, is 93%. So what's the conclusion from this? The conclusion from this segment is there are very, very highly effective treatments available. I'll be happy to take any number of questions on treatment. But I think we have bigger fish to fry here, so I will focus on that. Because less than 10% of the world's population has been cured of hepatitis C. Even though highly effective treatments exist, it's very, very difficult to get to all these people. We know that the only hope for mankind here for hepatitis C to save millions of lives, that primary care diagnosis of hepatitis C should occur. You should assess the severity of liver disease and treat patients and not leave it to specialists like me, basically. That's the bottom line here. This is the theme uh, why we want you to treat. So let me talk a little bit about what's the challenge here. So this is slides 
I borrowed from Clinical Care Options, uh, which is um, uh, an education firm, and they've permitted me to do this. So the World Health Organization realizes that, you know, 10, 20 million people could die from hepatitis C. We got to do something. So they have a goal of hepatitis C elimination by 2030. And, but there's a challenge is, only 10% of the world has been treated in the US. So you can see here, there are all different kinds of genotype all over the world. So if you go to Western Europe or US, it's all genotype one is the predominant one, that's blue. But if you go to India, it's genotype three, green. If you go to Egypt, et cetera, Genotype four is very big, yellow, and so on and so forth. So there are different genotypes, different parts of the world. The other thing to be realized is hepatitis C is not always a disease transmitted by drug use. So for example, what is the percentage of people who use drugs? If you go to Eastern Europe, 90%. See this? blue bar, all the way coming to 90% of people use drugs. High income countries, 80% of the people got hepatitis by using drugs. Western Europe, 85%. But now let's go to Central Asia, it's 40%. Globally, it's only 50%. Sub-Saharan Africa, they don't have a lot of IV drug use. Only 15% is due to IV drug use. It's because of unclean needles or other things while giving vaccinations, et cetera. So important to realize the different epidemiology of ECHO. In the US, we have a unique problem which all of you can help with. And that is a new group of people has emerged in the United States which have rising rates of hepatitis C. So previously we used to, some of you may have heard of this, born between 1945 and 65, right? This was true, birth cohort. And they are now in this age group. They are somewhere between 50 and 75 years. The problem is, there's this whole group of people who are between 19 and 35 that are getting very high rates. So now you see this distribution by gestational age. 79.8 per 100,000, 36% were born 1945 and 65. But really, the large number now is born between 1981 and 1996. And this is all drug use, basically. So because of the very high rates of intravenous drug use, where you all can help with, this new disease is emerging in young people in, in the United States. And it's a huge problem. So peak in adults age 25 to 39 now. Two-fold higher prevalence in men versus women. Two-fold higher prevalence in African-Americans versus other races. Three-fold higher prevalence in U.S. veterans. And these are the usual risk factors. So the challenge now, of course, is this red line. You know, this red line is the 20 to 29 year olds who are, you can see how low the acute rate of getting, acute HCV rate in the population was 0 0.7, now is 3.2. It's not massively going up. And we've got to do something as a community of people interested in substance use tackling this problem. So what is happening here 
is the US has a goal to reduce the rate of these acute infections to less than 35,000. So this blue line here, the one my arrow is going, is the target. But you see the actual cases are at going up instead of along the target line. The good news is that the death rate reduction is going along the target line. Why? Because death occurs after a few years and we are getting treatment to some of these people. But these people will later on in life develop a lot of problems if you don't do something about them. And this is the challenge we have, okay? That only half the people in the United States as of this study in 2014, now it's about 60%, actually know they have hepatitis C. That means they have it and they know they have it. So you've got 40% that still have to be diagnosed. Then when they have it, the problem is how do you give them access to care? Some of them are sitting in prison. Some of them are homeless. Some of them are using active drugs and they don't. So the, tr the problem we are running into is it's very hard for us to get people through this cascade of, okay, now you have antibody positive. Will you come back for your HCV RNA test? If you don't do that, you drop off and so on. So what do we need to do to get the other 40% of people who don't, who have it, but they don't know? We need to screen in specific populations. So decrease, there's an overall prevalence of viremic hepatitis C is going down in US born white persons and black persons, but there is, um, the challenge that 80% of the people who don't know they have the virus were not tested, they've been to a doctor. 80% of them have been to a doctor within 12 months and the doctor never tested them for hepatitis C. So this is a huge problem for us, okay? Because it all starts with the doctor doing the test. If you don't do the test, you're not going to do anything. So these are the recommendations here of the US Preventive Task Force. Every adult between 18 and 79 needs a hepatitis C test. And I don't know if many of you work in hospitals or whatever, or clinics, you'll see lots of people in your clinics who are between this age group who've never had the test. So I would encourage you to please go and put programs in your clinics. So there's a prompt occurring in the electronic record. Do, there's no hepatitis C test here. Did you want to order it? Or put a prompt in, or, or put something in your EMR saying, if there is no hepatitis C test between this age group, please automatically do it. The other problem that we are facing is this racial disparity problem. That blacks and Hispanics don't really have the same access. So there's variable distribution by race ethnicity with regard to the screening, linkage to care, treatment, access, and initiation. So if you're black, it's very hard for you to get onto this train than if you're white. So we have to create culturally sensitive models. And I'm, I'm not a, going to tell you how to do this, but asking the question, how can you get different races to get the same level of care? The other issue to remember is that some groups of people in the United States have much higher risk of hepatitis C complications. Hispanics is that group. You'll see here, eight-year incidence of hepatic compensation is higher in Hispanics, and the liver cancer risk, 28% versus 18% at eight years. Why is that? 
the cause of obesity and metabolic risk factors. Remember we said, if you're obese, there's much greater likelihood of developing cirrhosis. So this was one study done um, um, essentially recently published about three, four years ago. This study was published earlier. Um, this is in the VA registry, Veterans Administration, very large numbers of patients, 149,000. And you can see here for Hispanics, the risk of liver cancer is twice and the risk of cirrhosis is 1.25 times. Another study, same result. Obese with diabetes mellitus, the odds ratio, very high okay, of developing complications. Another group of people that has huge problems is Native Americans. One of the challenges we are facing and your group can help address those issues is Native Americans and Alaskan Natives are having higher rates of IV drug use now. And what should be the approaches for that? So this is because of increasing opioid use and HCV in these. And therefore, they have much higher rates of acute hepatitis C. African Americans, as I mentioned, twice as high as non Hispanic whites, higher risk of end stage liver disease complications, twice the rate of liver cancer, and their chances of getting a liver transplant are much, much lower than whites. So, this is another reason for paying a lot of attention. But the good news here is no matter whether you're black, or white, male or female, whether you've been drinking or you're not drinking, whether you have a mental health diagnosis or you don't have it, it doesn't matter. You take these medicines, you're gonna get cured. You see this line here, these dots, they're all close to 100%, right? This is 90, this is 100. So everybody can get cured. Treatment experience, treatment night. That's the great thing is if you treat hepatitis C, you will save many, many lives. Another whole area where you all need to argue for, and we successfully did it in New Mexico, we are treating 600 prisoners. But we only have about 2,400 patients with hepatitis C in our prison. They're treating 600 every year, just to let you know. But in the nation, the challenge is Blacks and Hispanics are much more in the prison. So for example, Blacks are 12% of the US adult population, 33% of the prison population. Hispanics are 16% of the population, but 23% in the prison. Whites is reverse. We are 63% of the population here, whites are, and the prison only 30%. So this exacerbates the racial, and prisoners are not getting hepatitis C treatment. You see how difficult it becomes then? So we need to solve these systemic inequities if we're going to save all these lives in healthcare and housing and education, criminal justice, inadequate access to quality education, all of these are risk factors of a hepatitis C, low income. And um, so we need to improve access to care for the other, uh, for everyone. The risk of hepatitis. Now I want to share some very recent data that has come out on hepatitis C. This is what is the risk of liver cancer after you cure them. Okay. So this is a very large study from Japan and patients who got a cure rate. And what they're saying is huge reduction. So at five, six years, only two and a half percent of people get liver cancer. And if you don't have cirrhosis, of course, it's very low. 
But there are three risk factors, and this is what all of you should watch out for. If the age is over 65, and if the ALT level is over 30, and the alpha fetoprotein level is over five after you cure your patients, then their risk of liver cancer is a little higher. So keeping that in mind, that you can now distinguish who are the people who have the higher risk of liver cancer, okay? And this is, uh, again, another study. Um, I, I think I, it's, they all say the same thing, so I'm gonna skip those. Again, without cirrhosis, you can see on the right. And with cirrhosis, the risk is very high. And um, you've got to cure these people. So basically, this is really important. This is a very important paper showing in JAMA that when you do use ECHO for project for hepatitis C, this is 267,000. 900 patients, if you use ECHO, then a lot more primary care doctors treat hepatitis C, and you can make a big difference to the population through ECHO training of primary care clinicians to treat hepatitis C. Now we have 500 peer-reviewed publications showing ECHO works in, hep in hepatitis C and 70 other disease areas and substance use disorders. There was a recent paper in JAMA from Minnesota, I think, showing that the Boxone patients, people who participated in ECHO, they prescribed a lot more buprenorphine. And I'm pretty sure your data was included in that. So congratulations. <laughs> you are showing the world that ECHO can improve substance use treatment. And this last paper showed the world, both in JAMA, that ECHO can improve access to hepatitis C treatment. But now we have 500 publications showing it works, so I hope it will spread. We have 385 hubs in the United States, and we are particularly proud of Heather and Kurt's hub, ECHO hub. Globally, we have now 855 hubs in the world. And for behavioral health and addiction, there are now 1,000 networks in the world just for behavioral health and addiction, just to let you know. In the US alone, we have 400 ECHO projects for mental health and addiction, 10,000 plus ECHO sessions. This is that beautiful paper from Minnesota showing opioid prescriptions go up in ECHO versus non-ECHO. These are red line is ECHO, blue line is non-ECHO. Overall in the world, today we have 3.91 million learners in 193 countries. So ECHO, you can see, continues to expand. And uh, I'll stop here and um, take any questions. I know I ran out of time. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, you're Heather, fine. I lost track of time. So, uh, if, but I'll still take questions if you guys have time. Oh, yes. Plenty of time. Thank you so much. A few questions, especially kind of towards the end of things, because those are a little bit more new with, um, you know, monitoring and, and all of that with hepatitis C and, the, and the, the cancer. With the fibro scanning, does that impact whether one, you would need treatment or, you know, especially because they're not very accessible. And does that factor into then long-term screening or management? Like if you hadn't had one early, you know, does that impact, you know, long-term care? No. If you can make the diagnosis of cirrhosis without a fibro scan, which you can usually either by clinical, low albumin, low plated count, spider nevi, history of bleeding, um, et cetera, then you don't need, you can just start screening with ultrasounds after the cure six month, every six months. Fibroscan is only necessary for those people where you have a doubt 
as to whether patient has F3 or F4, that is advanced fibrosis. And because the reason why then it's helpful is, um, Heather, is you don't want to subject this person to ultrasound and alpha protein every six months if they don't need it. Because if you don't have cirrhosis, you don't need that. But I would say only about 15% of people will need a fibro scan because most of the time with training, you'll be able to diagnose uh, early cirrhosis quickly. And I know Heather, you and Kurt can do that. So hopefully you can help and train. Okay. So is that something like, you know, a diagnosis or, you know, an initial diagnosis of hepatitis C and the treatment where you wouldn't, you know, the person doesn't have cirrhosis, like the chance of them developing it even after a positive success, successful treatment, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's always like, what's the long-term management of a person who's maybe been successfully treated or who like, you know, they had a positive antibody, but they have a negative RNA quant, even though they've never had treatment is like, what's the, the next steps for those patients? So if you cure the person, you have an SVR and they don't go back to drug use and liver function tests are normal, nothing else is required or okay. ever. That's one. Patients who have an antibody and negative HCV RNA and they've never been treated, these people, if they have high liver function tests, they need to be sent to a liver specialist or somebody to check for other causes of liver disease, such as you know Wilson's disease or NASH or whatever, right? Because they still have liver disease, but they don't have hepatitis C. And third, I mean, um, if you have cirrhosis of the liver and you cure them, then they need to enter screening, ultrasound and AFP every six months. We don't exactly know how long it goes on, but the slide I skipped, which you can look at later, shows that the risk declines with time. So the most important period of these ultrasounds is the first five years uh, of uh, after cure of cirrhosis, uh, hepatitis C and cirrhosis. Because during those five years, almost all the cancers that have to occur will occur. After that, very few. Sanjeev, I'm wondering if you have any sense what percentage of prescriptions for hepatitis C treatment are coming from primary care? We don't have that data, but it's still a small percentage because the problem, and Heather and Kurt, you know this better than anybody else in the world, is in our fee-for-service model, people like Heather and Kurt don't get reimbursed for spending their time you know, doing echo. You don't get reimbursed for your time you spend learning your things. And so what happens is it's, it's largely a volunteer effort trying to help your communities. And so, so much more of echo needs to spread in the United States. And we need to find an effective payment mechanism for all of you. That is a barrier for us. But because there are so many amazing people who have amazing hearts, right? They spend their time and do it anyway. And But, you know, you all need to listen to a talk by Donald Berwick. Don Berwick is the name. So on YouTube, about three weeks ago, he gave a keynote address at the IHI, Institute for Healthcare Improvement Conference. It's on YouTube, it's about 45 minutes top long. And it explains to you what's wrong with our health system, which is not allowing us to achieve the objectives of what we want, okay? I think this audience will learn a lot from that talk because we need your help to change the health system. And for that, it's important to understand what's driving this dysfunction. Okay, I'm going to ask kind of a nuanced question, and maybe it's a little bit too nuanced. 
you know, someone who just because we are working a lot in an addiction clinic now, so you get a positive hep C, negative RNA, still a high risk patient who still maybe is using substances, IV substances, you know, periodic screening. How often is that like a six months thing that we keep checking? And then are you checking I me? Mean, you can't check for the antibodies. We already know that's positive. Do you check for RNA then every six months or, or how do you look at that? Yes. So that's a really beautiful question. If somebody is using drugs and sharing needles, I think HCG RNA test is required. Um, HCV RNA test is required uh, if you're going to make the diagnosis of hepatitis C. There's no other way. I think the frequency should depend on the desire of the patient to actually engage in treatment. So, you know, what's the point of doing all these tests if you, if you, if the patient is not willing to work with you to really um, change, you know, improve their health, right? But if a person is truly willing to work with you, is trying and falling off the wagon, and you want to help them, then every six months is a good time to get that test. Because one of the things is this very interesting data that actually when you treat people and cure their hepatitis C, it gives them encouragement, right, of how to uh, improve themselves, gives them hope. And in many cases, people have said that it helps them with their recovery from drugs too, not just from, does that make sense what I'm saying? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, because you engage with them and, and this is huge. Uh, they know somebody cares for them. All of this is associated with hepatitis C treatment. They say, you know, Heather is interested enough to me that she's gonna give me a $20,000 treatment, right? Okay, somebody, Alona has put this um, video. Oh, this, this is the talk from 2023. I mean, uh, from 2020, uh, December of 2022. Okay, just so that you know, you get the right one. Okay. So I, I want to just chime in if you guys can hear me. Yes, we can. Um, I'm Kayla Nelson. I'm a provider in Fargo, North Dakota. And I've been treating hep C um, for probably for closer to four years um, in primary care and doing fiber scans. I got trained how to do that. And I do buprenorphine. Um, and I recently in the last year have transitioned to doing SUD full time, mostly full time and treating hepatitis C in a treatment center. Um, and I just want to comment on how awesome of a little refresher this was, but um, also to say like my patients who use and who I've treated, it's just like one of the best things I've ever done <laughs> in my job. Um, to be able to tell somebody like you have SVR 12, it's gone. Um, it, like even so, I have had a few people return to use, but they have always gone to the needle exchange and they've taken that very seriously. Um, and it seems to just motivate them enough to at least in that piece, um, make a change. That's such That's a beautiful, awesome. uh, such a beautiful comment, Dr. Nelson. I'll tell you, people don't study this enough, but what that patient received from you was that Dr. Nelson cares for me enough, first of all, that she gave me a $20,000 treatment. She, everybody else in the world is just looking down on me and and blowing me away and as a gone case, there is Dr. Nelson has sort of adopted me as someone she cares for. Then she took the interest of treating me, get my medicine, the $20,000 medicine. But at the end, she celebrated my success with me. This is a big deal. And mm -hmm. it makes a difference in people's lives. So that's why I look at hepatitis C treatment as a part of substance use treatment. 
And if you look at it that way, and I'll tell you that any primary care doctor who adopts doing hepatitis C treatment will personally save hundreds of lives over their lifetime. Hundreds. I'm not talking about five lives here and three lives there. When you treat a thousand patients with hepatitis C over years and years and years, you're going to save hundreds of lives. That's just a fact of life. It's a big deal, this treatment. Mm -hmm. Does this, can you get another strain of hep C after treatment or after spontaneous resolution? Like, how does that work? I mean, because obviously if there's drug resistance, I would, I guess, assume that it's not a perfect antibody protection, but what do you see that? Yes. Uh, no matter how many times you treat hepatitis C, if the person uses drugs, they'll get reinfected. So that's a challenge. But the flip side of it is if they don't use drugs, almost no one will get ever infected again. So that's the I mean, they can use drugs, but I'm talking about if they share needles, sorry. Um, first, uh, Kayla, that was amazing, by the way. Um, second, you know, is there anything that predicts whether somebody will have resistance? Yes. Resistance depends on non-compliance. <laughs> that is, people who take the medicine irregularly. You cannot take this medicine as a blood pressure medicine and an antidepressant, okay? Where you take half the doses and still get half the effect, okay? This is more like pregnancy. It's either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant, right? It's an all or none thing. So you got to have a patient who takes their medicine, basically. That's all. They can keep using drugs, use needles, whatever. But you must have somebody who gets that medicine. And the way I work on that is I usually want somebody in their family to take responsibility for that section of their life, getting the pills into their body, basically. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to actually sometimes hurt them because they will now develop a resistant strain. So first you were using the $20,000 medicine, right? Medicaid was paying for it. But the next round, you have a $90,000 medicine. Medicaid will still pay for it. But the problem is, can we do that? So go ahead, um, Dr. Nelson. You want to say something? Doesn't sound like it. Okay. Have you seen... Uh... Sanjeev, in any of like, just obviously you have interaction with all these hepatitis C echoes across the country. Have you ever seen the kind of like what you just said, someone else helping them manage their meds, getting them in every day where something like an OTP or um, there are clinics that will do daily dosing of Suboxone where they kind of daily dose their, their Suboxone or their methadone with their daily dose of, of hepatitis C treatment. Do you, do you see perfect. this? I, I have seen it, but the thing about it is usually is that the methadone clinics are not very keen to do it for whatever reason. The economics of methadone clinics is different, but um, that is the very best way to do this, in my view. Uh, in the prisons, you know, we treat 600, right, every day. Guess what we do? I mean, every year we treat 600 in our prison. We do directly observe therapy. Basically, they come in the medicine line and they get their medicine for Epsi. And guess what? Our cure rates are off the roof, off the chart, right? Because we know this medicine once gets in. And Kayla, maybe you want to comment on your experience. When the medicine gets in, the virus goes away, right? So how do you get it paid for in the prisons and the jails? Because this has come up in at least the county jails in Minnesota when I was working in those and Kurt was working in those and Aaron was working in those. I accidentally ordered a hep C antibody, heaven forbid. And then it was, I mean, everything was positive. And then the jail mm -hmm. got really mad at me because I'm like, we have to treat this. Mm -hmm. And there was no way to pay for it. So yeah, I wonder if there's, I'm not is. sure if they have like resources in Minnesota, I think they've come, you know, we're, we're coming a long way in North Dakota with hep C treatment. Um, I think MA is really coming around 
North Dakota wise with payment, um, especially if the patient's engaged in some form of treatment. A lot of my patients that were in the prison system were told, you know, maybe their viral count wasn't high enough or um, there was, yeah, there's not, not evidence that the their case was severe enough to treat while they were there due to the cost. But I do think that conversation is there and heading in the right direction. Um, and I know our prison medical director is pretty on board with doing that if we can get payers on board. But yeah, I agree. I don't have resources at the ready right now. Yeah, I think the prison, we had to go to the legislature and get a special appropriation for the prisoners. And the jail, we are not able to treat here. They are, they are completely different things. Prison, right. the prison is the junction uh, is the responsibility of the state, and um, you know there are lawsuits and consent degrees and all that and that degree and and um, whereas in jail, there are responsibilities of counties. I currently work at the county jail in Hennepin, and we can test all we want. Um, they'll pay for the test. They encourage the test. However, unless they're an F3 or an F4, they will not pay for it. Um, I do try and set them up with Hennepin County Hepatitis C Clinic um, for when they're discharged. Whether or not the patients show up or not, I don't know, but we are not allowed to test for it unless their F score is high enough or to treat for it, sorry. And um, anybody else? Um, let me just look through the list. I don't know. I think we're a little over time there as well. We Heather. are. Yeah. Thank you. Bye -bye. No, well, Dr. Sanji, really thank you again so much. We really appreciate you, uh, you, you coming and stopping by and teaching us all. It was just a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for Although the side. weather in Albuquerque is way nicer than here, so we should have flown there to do it from that table. <laughs> it is, yes, we do have amazing weather, and I'll show you the weather outside in a second. You can see. Can you see outside, guys? I see sun and beautiful. Uh, oh, man. You can see so the, by the way, snow. Yeah, we have a Meta Echo Global Conference from September 18th to 21st here in 2023. I hope you'll all come for them. And if, if uh, Heather and Kurt, if you could uh, forward the invitation to your colleagues on this call, we would love to have you come visit and attend our MetaEcho Global Conference. We're anticipating 2,000 people from 50 countries, okay? Wow. We'll look Bye -bye. into that. Yes. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody. And Dr. Aurora, thank you. Bye-bye.